welcome to class. Uh, I really actually like this room because of the windows and like all the AV stuff that's in here. Uh, one of the cool things about the room is that there are cameras for video conferencing, and I'm using that camera in the back to record the lectures, so hopefully I'll be able to post uh, videos of all the lectures online in case you need to miss one or if you want to review them. Um, but without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so I'm Steve Tarzia. Most of you probably don't know me. Uh, maybe, I think maybe one or two of you I had in the last uh, quarter, but I'm a new, new lecturer here, and uh, I taught 317 um, data management and information processing last quarter. But, you know, this course is normally taught by Fabian Bustamante. Um, so it's going to be similar in some ways, but different in other ways. And hopefully better. You'll be the judge. <laughs> That's the goal, anyway. All right. But, you know, this is going to be a typical first lecture. I'm just going to give an overview of the class and explain um, what you're going to learn from it and, uh, like, what the mechanics of the course are going to be. Because it's going to be a little different than than the way it was taught in the past. And I'm sure some of you have heard from your friends uh, what their experiences were in, in previous iterations of this class. OK, I'm going to try to have a five-minute break in the middle of the class just to let you stretch and use the bathroom or whatever, um, check your phone. Uh, but that depends on how um, whether we're running on time or behind. Okay. And then after the break, I'm going to just introduce the concept of operating systems and a little bit of the history, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. but um, perhaps not, not in as much detail as I'll go into. So I believe this course is required for the undergraduate major in computer science, and I think a lot of other students from other majors take it. Um, and I think the reason it's a requirement, although I didn't make the decision to make it a requirement, the, the, I think the reasoning is, is not because you're going to write an OS in the future. Like I don't think very many people write new operating systems. Like Yes, there are some people at Microsoft and some people in the open source community that do actually write operating systems. But uh, probably more importantly, all of you will write code that runs on top of an operating system. So in order to kind of understand how your code as an application developer, whether you're writing like web applications or mobile apps or whatever, to understand how that code is running, like what might cause it to slow down and, um, or, or to crash, you kind of need to understand what the operating system is doing and how the operating system is balancing the needs of all the different processes that are running on a given machine. All right, and it's also, of course, a theoretically interesting concept, um, an operating system is. Uh, and this is also a course that's going to challenge you in the sense that you're going to have to work on large code bases. Like, you're going to work on this, this operating system called XV6 which is it's a teaching operating system. It's a simplified operating system, but it's still like 60,000 lines of code, which is probably way more than anything you've written yourself, for sure. Uh, it's bigger than anything I've written, uh, probably. Uh, but you know, it, it's a lot different to you know, write a small program that solves a specific problem than it is to jump into a huge code base that does a lot of different things and to sort of understand what that code does and make small changes that make the changes, the, the implement the changes you want to make without breaking everything else that was already implemented, right? So it's a very different way of operating, and it's challenging. And in the real world, when you, uh, if you get a job as a software engineer, uh, you know, on day one, you're not going to write new, uh, a totally new system. You'll probably have to join a team that already has code, has some product, and your task is to like figure out what's going on there and figure out like what small change changes uh, you can make to improve things without totally breaking everything else that, that was already built, OK? And so you're going to get that practice <coughs> in the C language in a Linux environment. Um, although the operating system you're building is not Linux, you'll be doing the coding in Linux to build an operating system that runs inside of a virtual machine in Linux. Uh, but you'll be using make and git and GCC, GDB, all the typical kind of C development tools that you may have used in the past, you may not have used. If you haven't used every single one of these, like for example, you may not have used git before, uh, you'll get help from, uh, especially from the TAs and uh, peer mentors in recitation sessions and so forth. But I'll talk more about that later. So anytime you have a question, please stop me. I'll try to 
scan as I go. Uh, if I miss you, just be patient and hold your hand up, OK? Um, so there are a lot of different ways to kind of create an outline for operating systems. And I looked at a bunch of different textbooks. And you know, each one has a slightly different variation. But to me, what I think is most important about this course, or like what's most fundamental to operating systems, is uh, how operating systems affect security, performance, and concurrency. And these are actually not the main topics you'll see in the table of contents in an operating system book, because there are a lot of things that you have to implement to make an operating system work, like scheduling and memory management. Those are all important components of an operating system. But then I think from those uh, various topics, the, the things you actually learn uh, for application development anyway relate to security, performance, and concurrency. So when I, specifically for security, uh, what you'll learn is how different processes on a single machine are isolated from each other. So the way that you can actually have a you know, desktop or a mobile phone that has several different apps that are running that can do their work and, and provide useful services, but actually not have the ability to uh, steal information from each other. And this actually relates to this recent Spectre and Meltdown attack, which you may have seen in the news like last week. Uh, that was a big deal. Um, I'll, I'll try to weave that into some of the lectures in this class. So Spectre and Meltdown are these vulnerabilities that were uh, announced in um, it, about a week ago, which basically show how uh, a, a process running on a, basically a typical Intel processor, so basically like any computer you have, you might have, uh, like the assumptions that people had about uh, how pro about processes being isolated actually were violated because the hardware was not doing and not isolating all the information it should have. I'll go more into, more into that later, I guess. There are some basic methods for isolating processes that are well known, but then there's some subtleties which allow these, uh, which will actually allow these spectre and meltdown attacks. Um, and it's actually an interesting case study to look at those uh, particular attacks. P performance is, is a big one because when you when you write code, you kind of see a simple, for example, if you write a for loop that you know 100 times prints something out. Uh, when you run it on a computer, it's not going to actually do that, like just to do that uh, one thing, because you're sharing hardware with a lot of different uh, processes on that machine. So it could, your uh, code is going to get interrupted, and someone else's code is going to run. When I say someone else's, I mean like some other programmers, but you know, other code on the machine is going to run, and that affects performance. And which types of interruptions are uh, slow and fast depend on um, the hardware, and you know, depending on how much computer engineering knowledge you have. In terms of like computer architecture, you may already know some of this stuff, and maybe you may end up at the end of this class knowing more about um, the performance implementations of operating systems if you know more about the hardware. But even if you know very little, um, I think you'll still get some important information about um, per per performance on real systems. Okay. And the third big topic is concurrency, meaning like when you have code running at the same time, two different processes, or, or two or more different processes. Um, you need to have a way for them to, or you'd like to have a way for them to share information if they want to share information. You know, secu the security uh, policies prevent sharing information when you, when you do not allow sharing information. But when you do want to share information, like if you have four or eight processors on a computer and you want to do some tasks very quickly, you want to divide the work among those, um, how, you, how those um, processes share data uh, requires some, some synchronization techniques that you probably haven't seen before. And also, because of the scheduling and, uh, and the way the hardware works, you end up with non-determinism, meaning that your code actually can run in, in different ways depending on, like, each time you run the code, it could run differently, which is kind of a weird thing. Um, but you'll kind of see how that happens in a lot of real systems. It depends on, because when your code runs, it's actually uh, interrupted by the operating system to allow other uh, other code to run. And the way that happens isn't really predictable. It depends on like a lot of things going on. Like, did the user just move the mouse? Um, did a network packet just come in for the computer to service? All those things affect how things are interrupted, and that results in non-determinism. Okay. Um, 
don't worry too much if, if these things don't make sense now, but this is just a, a flavor of what's to come. Okay. So about the logistics of the course, I'm going to use Canvas for a lot of stuff. So you know, posting assignments for you to turn in your assignments, you'll do that on Canvas. Um, I'm going to make announcements. Like, for example, I made an announcement uh, a couple hours ago or an hour ago on Canvas, and you should get an email notification for those. I'm going to post lecture slides to Canvas and hopefully these videos if, if this camera works. Um, and as far as staff goes, there's myself, there's a TA, Ying Yi, uh, who's a PhD student in computer engineering. She will have office hours. I don't know when that's going to be yet, but I'll send out an announcement when that's settled. And we also have uh, four peer mentors who are, I think, advanced undergraduate students who've taken the course before and done very well in the course. And they will be available to help you with your programming assignments and, and, and so forth. So this course tends to be, I think, challenging for a lot of students because uh, there is a lot of coding. Um, but I'm hoping to provide enough support uh, to make it possible for anyone to do well in the course if you're willing to put in the time and willing to get help if you need it. Okay. So the main thing is to uh, start your assignments early and ask for help when you need it. I'm sure many of you have friends in the class you can talk to for help, which is great. But if you don't, um, they're going to be la open lab hours and peer mentors and t t TA and myself available to, to help you along. Okay. Now, you should all know the prerequisites because you signed up for the course, and you shouldn't have signed up if you did not know the prerequisites, or if, without looking at the prerequisites, I mean. But let me just state again so we're very clear. You should have taken data structures or something like this class if you're like a new grad student at some, some previous school. So you should know what a linked list is, a hash table, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, you should have you should have used the C language before. If you haven't used C at all, I think this is going to be a huge struggle. So you might want to reconsider taking the class if you've never used C. Okay. Because a lot of what makes this course difficult is just using the C language. Um, you don't have to be an expert in C. I think you'll become more of an expert after this class. I don't think you'll be an expert when you finish the class. <laughs> Uh, but you'll be better at it. But you should at least have, have done some very basic C. Um, and ideally done that C programming in a Unix-like environment, like on a command line, like compiled stuff on a command line. If you haven't done that, um, it, it's going to make this course more challenging. Uh, talk to me. But you know, we have this, this course 213, which gives you that background. And um, you also should have some knowledge of assembly code and computer architecture, which is usually provided to students through this 213 course, uh, which I think is called Introduction to Computer Systems. But if you're like a computer engineering major or you came from a different school, you may have gotten that background elsewhere. For example, uh, the ECS 205 course, I think, is an assembly language programming course. That would also be good preparation for this class. All right, so if you're not sure if you have enough background or the right background, um, I think it's pretty easy to find out. Just start the first project, which is, has been posted this morning. And if you can um, get through the first two parts, which should only take um, like maybe an hour or two, if you can get through that and then you can you read the third part and it looks reasonable, then that's that's a good sign. The third part is really what's going to take a long time. Um, but I actually would advise everyone to start working on the first project as soon as possible and just get it over with. Like you might as well get it over with. And getting it done sooner um, will let you know if you need to drop the class, basically. right? Because if you're going to drop the class, you should do that sooner rather than later so you can switch to another class in time to do well in that other class. Not that I, I want to lose students, <laughs> but like for some of you, you just haven't like taken the right prerequisites yet. Um, and you, you could do better in the class later after having taken some other courses. Um, okay. And I say that only because I know from the reviews that a lot of students have complained that it's a difficult course and that they struggle with the programming. Okay? But like I said, I'm going to try to provide more support. Um, but also, I want to try to make, give, like, get you started on this first project sooner so that you, don't, you aren't surprised later on. Okay? All right, so grading is going to be 50% projects. And these are the most difficult parts. So it's going to be C kernel, uh, OS kernel development. And there's other stuff like. We are going to have two exams in class. 
which are in total going to be 40% of the grade. And we're going to have homework assignments, which are different than the projects, which are just going to be like answering questions about operating systems concepts. This is going to be based on lectures and readings. Um, which, yeah, so the projects, I know what they are all going to be. The homework assignments I haven't written yet. And those will probably be drawn from like uh, a few textbooks that I have. Um, those will be pretty straightforward. Um, yeah. Any questions about this stuff? Yes? How about quiz? I did some quiz all the time. Yeah, quiz, you saw quizzes in Canvas? Yeah. OK, so I apologize for that. There should not be quizzes in Canvas. That was from the previous quarter. OK, so the quizzes have been replaced by uh, homework assignments. Do you actually see the quizzes? OK, well, you, all right, so I'll remove those after this lecture. Wow. That's my mistake. So Fabian had quizzes in, cl in class, I think. Um, but they can't be what? Oh, they're, you just, OK. Well, that's good, at least. I, I mean, I wasn't planning to use them, those questions anyway, but um, yeah. OK, so, I, so I've replaced the quizzes with homework assignments, basically, which are going to be very much like the quizzes. So it's almost the same thing. <laughs> so you can think of the quizzes as the home, those quizzes you see as homework assignments, except the number is going to be different. I think it'll be four instead of like seven. OK. Whoa. All right, so like I said, you're going to use the C language. Um, why do we use the C language? Because it lets you interact with the hardware directly. And it lets you like throw in some assembly code when you need to, because actually you do need to use assembly code to, to kind of like switch the mode of the processor and to set up memory, things like that. Um, you know, we'll talk about that when the time comes. To handle interrupts, like you have to deal with special registers, especially when you're dealing with the Intel architecture, which is a really complicated, ugly processor. Like even though it's the most commonly used one, um, it's much uglier than like the RISC processors in your smartphones, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but that's what we're using, because uh, we're going to write a real operating system to run on a real machine, OK? Although it's a, it's a real small operating system. Uh, all right, so another reason we use C, the C language is because the tools compile it directly to machine code. Um, so we're kind of like working at a level that's very close to the hardware. You can actually look at the code that's generated the machine code and, and like try to, if you see a performance problem or you want to see if you can improve the performance by manually tweaking the code, you could do that. I mean, you're not going to do that in this class, uh, but that's why people in general use the C language for operating systems, one of the reasons. So another reason that people use C is because like it doesn't have any runtime translators or big libraries that are necessary. Like For example, if you were using um, Java or Python or, God forbid, JavaScript, like, there's all this code. Like, to run your program, you need a program to run your program, you know? And because we're writing the operating system, which is the very lowest level of the, of the hierarchy, like, it's the software that everything runs on top of, it has to sit by itself. You know, it can't require something else underneath it. Because we we're starting off with nothing, and we're, we're building from nothing. And C lets us do that, OK? Another thing about C is that the behavior is reasonably predictable. In other words, there's no garbage collection processes. I, I mean, I don't know how much, how many of you know what that is, even. Um, but I, I mean, so in a language like uh, Java or Python, you don't have to like your memory is cleaned up for you, and that happens in the background in an unpredictable way. So if, if that was true in your operating system, then there, there could be a time when you're doing something important, when suddenly the like runtime system decides, oh, I'm going to garbage collect now and go through and like do all this, this background work that slows things down at the very moment where you need it to be fast, right? So you need to have that control and predictability in your code uh, for the, in this operating system kernel because this is like uh, the very core of the, of the software in the system. Any questions about that? OK, that's why we use C. But here's why like, we, I don't like C, or why you all will not like C, <laughs> I'm sure. Right, so C was great in like the 1970s when it was invented. It was like state of the art, right? Okay, that's 40 years ago. Okay, a lot of things have happened since then. Okay, so I say it's it feels inconvenient and dangerous. So and I say it's like shaving with a straight razor, right? These days we have like much nicer ways of shaving, right? Uh, like you don't get as many cuts with Python as you do with C. Okay, and it's faster to write Python code than it is to write C code. 
just like a faster shape with a modern shape and then one of these old straight razors. Okay, so in particular, the things I don't like about C and that you all will not like about C are that it, it lacks standard dynamic collections, like lists or dictionaries. Like the things that you take for granted, when you write code, you want to be able to just like track things that you're creating or, or you're looking at. It's like, okay, create a list or dictionary. Like that's the, what you do in JavaScript. That's what you do in Python. You can't do that in C. I mean, you could do that if someone, if you write a library to do that or use someone else's library, but even with those libraries, it tends to be like a lot slower in terms of like there's a lot more code you have to write to, to use those things and you have to, to free uh, structures and, and things like that. Um, you have to manage the memory yourself. So you have to use malloc and free, uh, which is a pain, especially if you're sharing structures with other code. So like if, if, if you create a certain structure, like say, say dictionary, and it, it's used by many other pieces of code, it's hard to know when to free it if you don't have a garbage collector and you don't have reference counting. So if you're using C, you have to like either assume that you always keep it around just in case one of those other processes is still using it, or you have to, like in each one of those, increment a counter, and then that the counter has to be um, protected from being accessed twice at the same time. Like It's just a total mess, right? Um, you can't easily write generic code in C because you don't have um, like classes with inheritance, and all your, your parameters are strongly typed, at least pretty strongly typed. Um, you don't have exceptions. <coughs> exceptions are nice because um, it allows you to write code where like, you don't have to, every time you do something, check, like, was that successful? Like, I, I just tried to write something to the console. Did it actually work? If you're writing in a language that allows exceptions, you can just like, do something in one line. And then if there's a problem, there, like, you can handle that in some other code. I mean, I don't know. If some of you are not, may not be familiar with, with the idea of throwing and caching exceptions, if you are, um, you'll be frustrated by the lack of them in C. But it's, and in C code, you'll see a lot of checks. Like, whenever you do something, check the return value of that function, because um, that's the only way for you to know whether uh, something worked. Uh, and you also end up putting return values in function parameters. Like, uh, what's an example? Like, when you, uh, if you copy a string, for example, if you want to write a function to copy a string, you can't write a function that like returns the string, really, yeah, because like what you end up doing instead is like, okay, here's here's string copy my function. Instead of like just passing in the string that I want to copy and then getting back that copy, because like I don't, I, I can't, I don't necessarily want to allocate memory and return it back as a pointer. Um, what you end up doing is like having some input string, and then you'll have an output buffer. And then you'll have like a, a, a maximum length uh, of the buffer. Like you'll have like three, three different parameters. I don't know how well you guys can see that. In the, can you see that at all? Yeah, maybe from this angle it's, OK. Yeah, from the side, it's, maybe over there, can you see it? Not so much. Yeah, okay, it's not that important. Um, can you see the screen at least? I mean, that's pretty hard too. All right, um, but I'm passing in three different parameters to a function and just copy something because like, what I get back is actually going to go here, and then like what's what's returned is probably going to be like a status code where it's like zero if it succeeded and like minus one if it failed or like minus two if it failed for some other weird reason. Um, yeah, C kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are alternative ways to do this. This is the most common way to, to implement like a string copy. You don't have to do this in other languages. Um, all right. Another thing is that there's not really a good free IDE, like integrated development environment. Um, so you t typically, we'll use your, you know, your text editor of choice, maybe Emacs. That's what I use, Vim, get it. Plus, you'll um, use a, a uh, you have some kind of build system to, comp to actually manage like how, which different things are compiled and how it's all assembled, like make, and then you might use like something like GDB for uh, debugging it, like stepping through the code, like all those things in another language. Like if you're doing it in Java or, or Python or whatever, this would all be in one program, and it, you could like kind of um, run your code from the same place that you were writing your code, and you could step through your code in that same place. That's all a lot easier. Okay. 
But I don't know of a good way to do that in C. I mean, there are some tools, like, you could probably set up Eclipse to do this, but then it's like, it's kind of hard. So it's not something I've, I've recommended for this course. All right. So like I said, we're going to have, we're going to have a recitation. Unfortunately, it hasn't been scheduled yet. What I probably should have done is like uh, put it in Caesar for you guys to, to register for the recitation session along with this course. But instead, because uh, I didn't do that, I sent out a poll for you guys to pick times that you're free. And based on that, I'm going to try to choose like a time every week where we'll have a recitation or maybe two different recitation sessions if there are too many conflicts. Um, and if you do have a scheduling problem, I think that there will be other ways for you to get that information. Basically, it'll be a time for the TA uh, to talk about the, pro the projects, uh, to give you tips to help you uh, to do those, right? And there will also be lab hours in Wilkinson Lab, where the peer mentors and maybe the TA will be there to answer questions about your programming. Okay. So please do the doodle, doodle poll uh, today, all right? Has any, has, does everyone, everyone know where the Wilkinson Lab is? It's in tech, on the third floor, near the middle of the building. It's actually right next to the offices of the IT people for EECS. So if you have trouble with your accounts or whatever, you can ask them uh, for help. All right. So let me give you some quick history of this course. Uh, I, I, like I mentioned, it has been taught by Fabio Bustamante for a while, uh, for 15 years, actually. And um, I took his advanced operating system course, 443, in 2007, 11 years ago. So I'm passing on a little bit of the Fabian style, I guess, in this course. Um, and the projects are like almost identical to the ones from his course. The slides are different. Um, some of my slides are based on his slides, though. And I'm, try I, I, I'm going through and I'm doing these, the projects myself and figuring out which parts might be confusing. I'm trying to write, clarify the instructions and to give some more hints in the projects to make that uh, easier for you all. And I'm not sure about this, this next thing, but so far, I think that I'm going to try to get, make the assignments done individually by people rather than in groups. Um, so that might sound like it's more work, and it, it probably is more work for some, for some of you, but I don't, I don't really see how you can do uh, these projects in a group without like one person doing most of the work, right? Just because the actual code that you write is pretty small, like it's a pretty short amount of code that you need to write. I'm not saying that you can't work in groups, like you can't help each other. I'll, I'll talk more about this later, but I want you all to have the experience of like writing the final version of the code, making sure it works, like going through the debugging, like all the different steps in the process. If you're not doing that yourself, then um, you're not really going to learn what you need to learn from the course. All right, so this is an experiment. And it's also, it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's also going to create more work for us in grading. So I also have to, have to see whether that's going to be possible for us to grade like 60 assignments instead of um, you know 20 or 30. But uh, yeah, that's, I'm trying that individual assignments. I'm also requiring that you all use Git which is a like, version control system, because that's pretty standard. And um, it actually makes things a lot easier for you anyway. Like the previous instructions were telling people to like, download a tarball and like, extract it to get all these files, and then make your changes, and then tar it up again, and submit that whole tarball. Like, that's, that's fine. Like, that, that works. But with Git, you can just clone a repository. And then whenever you make changes, you'll know exactly like, what lines you've changed. And if you mess something up, you can easily roll back to the, like, what the code was like when you started. Uh, and I think that's a much easier way of working. And if, you know, the sooner you learn that way of working, uh, the better off you'll be in all your programming work. Uh, all right. So Fabian switched to using this XP6 operating system two years ago. Uh, and that's what we're using. All right, it was de developed by some MIT professors to teach their course. It's based on Unix 6. Uh, it's much smaller than Linux and other real operating systems, but it like it is still an operating system that does all the things that you would expect an operating system to do. It just doesn't do everything that Linux does. Um, and the idea is, I think, to make the programming assignments um, a little bit easier uh, for you all. Like it's easier to navigate through the code and figure out 
what's going on, because the real Linux code is pretty messy, and they have a lot of conventions you need to understand to really even understand basic stuff in the in the Linux code. Um, so that's just what we're doing. All right, like I said, we're replacing the quizzes with homework assignments, and I'm writing new exams. I'm also replacing, so relative to Fabian's version of the course, I'm replacing the uh, research articles he was assigning for reading with readings from a book called uh, Three Easy Pieces, which I'll talk about later. Okay. All right, so I talked a little bit about uh, group assignments, group work. So let me talk about the collaboration and cheating policy. It's hard to really nail this down, but the spirit of it is I think you guys should help each other. I think there are going to be times when you're working on an assignment and you've spent like hours and hours on something and you're just stuck. And it doesn't make sense. You're not going to get unstuck unless you talk to someone else. And if you talk to your friends and they can help you, that's great. Because you know, I'm not going to be there. Uh, the TA is not going to be there all the time to help you. All right. But I don't want you all to do things that prevent, that kind of allow another student to skip the learning process and to just not try at all and to just get something that looks like an answer and turn it in. Right? I think that that all uh, is reasonable. So you can talk to other students about the homework and the projects. Uh, you can look at each other's code, like on their on their computer screen, like. Uh, uh, but I don't want you to send your code to your friends, because then they can very easily just you know submit it as their own. If you want to send a few lines of your code, like that's probably fine. But if you just zip up your whole uh, project directory and say, oh, "Here's my assignment," um, this might help you. You know, even if, even if your your friend that says doesn't tell you that they're planning to turn it in exactly as their own, um, you shouldn't trust them. <laughs> uh, because they might do that, and then you'll both be in trouble. Uh, and then you know, it's, it's OK to copy code from the internet and small amounts of code from a friend. But when you, whenever you do that, you should just be really clear about explaining that in your code. So you should create a comment in your code whenever you copy code that says where you got it from. Because in, in, in um, that will, you know, prevent me from saying uh, that you cheated. You know, if you say I copy code from here, then you're making it very clear what you did, and uh, that's, you know, that's that's okay. I mean, you can't just say, oh, I copied everything from my friend so and so, and I turned it in. Like that's not acceptable. But if you got certain lines from them, and it, it, you think it might look like uh, you were cheating, if you just explain what you did in your assignment, then you know, I'll, I'll look at it and I'll I'll, I'll say, okay. Um, that's fine. You know, if it was too much, you might get some points deducted, but you wouldn't be. I would ne never say you were cheating if you told me exactly what you did. Okay. And if you're working on real code in the real world, if you're when you get a job as a software engineer, and you copy code from the internet, it's a very good policy to to create a comment that says where you got it from, because later on, if there's a problem with that code, um, you'll, the person who's looking at it will be able to go to that website and. Read, you know, get more information about the code to try to figure out, um, you know, what might be going on. Okay. All right. So you should understand what your code does. That's just like a natural consequence of having actually understood what you did and not just copied it directly. And in order to get us to make sure that you do understand the code that you submit, we're going to randomly choose students to explain their code to the TA in person. So. Um, They'll be call, called to an office, and you'll have to explain, like, this is what my code does, and so on and so forth. Um, this is just a way to uh, to scare you, <laughs> uh, to prevent you from from copying code that you don't understand. Okay, and if you understand the code and you copied it from your friend, if you really understand it and you can explain what it does, then you've you've learned that what what is necessary for the project. Okay. Um, and then that's okay in some sense. But if you just copied something and you don't have no idea what's what it does. And you're just trying to get points. Uh, you're going to get in trouble for that. Okay. I don't. I, I hope that doesn't contradict what I said before about um, about copying from friends. Okay. All right. So another rule of thumb: if you spend fewer than six hours on a project, you probably cheated. Okay. I did the first assignment. It took me about like four or five hours, um, which was longer than I expected. Uh, <laughs> I haven't used C in a long time, so. Um, take that into account, but anyway, uh, so it'll probably take you a while to do the first assignment, so I want you to start early. Yes.
Usually, they're, it's two weeks. And I think one of them is three weeks. OK? And so you do have an opportunity to start early and uh, you know, talk to the, the TAs if you, if you have trouble. All right. And OK, if I notice blatant cheating, I will notify the dean, and you'll get in trouble. You could be expelled from school. OK, you should know that. Um, you know, I don't expect that level of, of cheating to happen. Um, if you're unsure about anything, please ask me. Any questions about that? OK. All right, so the book I'm requiring you guys to read from is called Operating Systems, Three Easy Pieces. Uh, and they're not actually easy, but it's like this <laughs> phrase comes from, is a reference to a book by Feynman. Uh, it, it, these authors are really, uh, really talented uh, computer scientists from Wisconsin. And it's a good book. It's very entertaining to read. Uh, and it's actually a free book. It's not totally free. You can't download a PDF of the whole book. But you can download PDFs of each chapter individually. So you can read the whole thing for free, but you can't like download it and print out the whole thing unless you download about 30 or 40 different files and print them out individually. So I recommend that you uh, maybe buy the soft cover or hard cover edition. It's, they're pretty cheap. Or you could even buy the, the Ebook, which is like one big PDF for ten bucks, um, and basically what this book is going to do for you is repeat the material I teach in class, because just hearing it once in class, especially hearing it from me, is not going to be enough for you to really learn it. Okay, because I'm probably just going to mention things quickly, and um, I hope you ask questions when things are not clear. But uh, seeing seeing the stuff once is not enough to really internalize it. Okay, and you'll have to know this stuff for homework and exams. Because basically, the stuff I cover in the lectures and what's covered in the book is it, it's more content than what you'll have in the projects. So really, there are two big components of the class. There's the projects, and um, you know, there's a little bit of, of OS. Um, there are some important OS concepts covered in the projects, but it's only a small subset. And the majority of the work you're doing there is like learning like basically C programming. And, and kind of going through this big big project and understanding what's happening. Uh, so a, a large number of, of OS concepts are covered only in the reading and in lectures and only in the homework and exams. All right. Questions about that? All right. Oh, about me. This is a great slide. So like I said, uh, it's my first year teaching here. I actually got my PhD from Northwestern uh, seven years ago. And I did an undergrad at Columbia. So all my studies were in computer engineering, although my thesis was really more like computer science than computer engineering. Um, and after that, I worked as a software engineer in Chicago um, and also as a manager. And you know, I published, I kind of specialized in iOS apps for a while and published about 10 of those in the App Store. But I also done a lot of uh, like cloud computing backend stuff. And I especially like working with Linux, Amazon Web Services, Java. Python, Objective-C. Um, I also run this website, gunmemorial.org, which shows profiles of US gun violence victims. And you know, lap swimming, cooking, repairing things, music, those are my hobbies. And I lived in Evanston for six years, married for 12 years. That's me. OK. All right. And hopefully, I'll learn something about you in this uh, time frame. But we're actually going to, let's see if we have time. Oh. Let's, let's take. A, uh, a, I will say a five minute break, but during this break, um, some of you, you can ask questions if you want. If anything, so feel free to go use the bathroom or whatever. Um, also, feel free to ask questions. If any really important questions are asked, I'll repeat them when you all come back. So, let's say four minutes. Okay, so when it, when it goes to 1 15, we'll start again in, in earnest. All right. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of operating systems and how those concepts evolved. And it's th this story is, is really a combination of how the, the hardware evolved and how the software reacted to uh, those changes in hardware. Right. Um, but you know, when you think of operating systems, I'm sure that most of you think of you know, Windows and Mac OS and you know, Android, iOS, Linux, maybe BSD. These are, the, these are kind of present operating systems. That are well known, but you know, in the past, there have also been 
other important operating systems, in particular IBM OS 360, was uh, developed in the 70s, and it was the first um, first operating system that really allowed many different uh, programs to use the same computer at, at the same time. So that's a pretty fundamental uh, system. And afterwards, AT&T Unix kind of went a step further in creating something very close to what um, you'll be working on in class. And then you know, there's systems like DOS and, and classic Mac OS, which are actually less sophisticated in some ways than these other operating systems. But those are the systems that were uh, the operating systems that were uh, available on personal computers, which were these the kind of cheap computers that people had in their homes, which were much less sophisticated than the mainframes uh, that have been available for decades uh, to corporations. Right? And I kind of watched, personally, as operating systems evolved from DOS and Mac OS Classic and like Windows 3.1 through 95, XP 2000, and like, you know, all these present ones. So Unix is kind of interesting because there are a lot of different versions, <laughs> as you can see here. So uh, time is very small uh, on the left here from 1969 to uh, 2017. But you know, this, there's a certain, there was an operating system back in, on the PDP-7, which is a, a mini computer in, of the era. Uh, and then the first version of Unix was developed based on that system. And this was a very influential system because so many other uh, systems are based on it, either using the same code, which is what the lines indicate, or like Linux wasn't didn't borrow any code from the from the original Unix systems, but was kind of like built to look like it and to provide the same kind of functionality and to use the same philosophies. All right. So we're going to be talking a lot about Unix. Unix is a really uh, an important example of an operating system. Um, and XB6 is a Unix-like operating system. Uh, it has less than 80,000 lines of code, which is a lot of code, but also it's much less than like the 15 million or so that you might have in Linux. So uh, you can kind of, you, it's small enough that you could read all of it and understand everything that's going on in the operating system, which is definitely not true. Of, of Linux or Windows or Mac OS or you know uh, the, the mock kernel for Mac, for Mac OS, uh, but it has limited functionality. XP6 does. Um, later on, you'll kind of I think we'll talk more about what what's missing, and for some of your homework assignments, you'll implement some of the things that are missing. Actually, some very basic things that are missing. Um, so. But it is still a real operating system in the sense that it, it does work on, on real, although basic, PC-compatible hardware. Um, in the case of these homework assignments, you're going to be using uh, QMU, which is a, like a simulator or emulator of a machine to run this operating system. But you could actually build XV6, you compile XV6, and, into, and it gets compiled to two different files. You could take those files and copy them to two hard drives, take those two hard drives, plug them into a computer, and then turn on the computer, and then it would boot up and it would load XV6. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't go to Windows or Mac or whatever. It, it would just load up XV6 and that would be the operating system. Uh, but like I said, you're not going to be running your code on hardware. You'll be running it on a, a simulated hardware uh, through QMU. All right. And XV6 lacks. Uh, device drivers for real hardware. And that's a lot of these 15 million lines of code in Linux are not from like the, the basic functionality of the operating system, but to support thousands of different devices that you might plug into a Linux computer. Okay, Because each one of those uh, devices ha has uh, quirks, and um, it has a certain way of, of operating it. And the device drivers, I'll talk more about this later, but device drivers are a way to like make to allow programs to access a variety of different variations of the same kind of hardware. Like if you have 100 different network cards that you can plug into a computer that allow the computer to talk to a network, um, your code that, like your web browser code, for example, shouldn't have to know, shouldn't care which of those 100 different network cards you're using. It should just interact through a simple, uh, the standard a API uh, in the operating system to, to access it. And what the device driver has to then translate those intentions into the specific instructions 
for the specific hardware that you're using. Okay, and that's where all this this blow all this blow up of like 15 million different codes comes from. Okay, so you probably know a lot of this from your experience, but um, formally the roles of an operating system are varied. Um, the one that's most obvious is like the user interface that the OS provides for humans to run programs. Uh, that 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 is like the most apparent thing. That's actually the least important thing for this course. <laughs> like, we're not going to be talking about op user interfaces. It's, it's actually very interesting how interfaces in operating systems have evolved over time, from command line to like various different types of windowing systems. And uh, mobile uh, interfaces are very different as well. And there are different variations of mobile interfaces. But um, that's kind of outside the scope of this class. The two things that we are going to talk about, especially this, the, this first thing, are, are how the OS is a resource manager that allows multiple programs to share one set of hardware. And in particular, you know, you have one, one CPU. I mean, you could, you could have multiple cores. You could actually have multiple CPUs. But let's imagine, in a simple case, you have one CPU. You want to allow multiple programs to use it. You have one like set of memory. Uh, you know, you have random access memory, which is essentially an array of for storage, and that single array has to be shared by many different programs. Um, and then you have, like I said, the network cards and the file systems. Those are also resources that have to be shared uh, by the different processes, and that's done by the OS. Okay. And in doing so, the OS provides a programming interface for programs to access the hardware and other services, um, and do that in a way that doesn't interfere with the operation of other processes on the computer. Okay. All right. So there was a time before operating systems. And if you've studied computer architecture or organization or written assembly code, you kind of have a sense of that. Like the CPU has certain instructions that it can run to do math and to interact with hardware. And theoretically, you can string all those things together to create a program that does useful work. And um, that is what you do. But you, know, you, can, you can run that code directly on the hardware. And that's what used to happen in the old days. So what I'm showing here is uh, a favorite game of mine called King's Quest from uh, 1983. So I had this game as a, as a young kid. And the, the version I had was for, this IBM P for the IBM PC Junior computer, which was a really, really cheap, uh, slow computer that was developed in the early 80s by IBM. You notice it's PC Junior because it was, much, it was cheaper than the, the IBM PC. And you know, the one I had in the early 90s was, was um, from a yard sale or whatever. So it was old, when I had it, it was quite old at the time. But um, this, this computer, IBM PC Junior, did not have an operating system. It had floppy disks that you like, plugged into the computer. And when you turn on the computer, the computer would just read that, the program off that floppy disk. Right? There wasn't a hard disk in the computer that stored an operating system. Um, if you turn on the computer without a disk installed, it, would, it wouldn't boot up an operating system. It would boot up like a basic interpreter, which is on, on, in, in a ROM chip on, in, in the computer. Uh, but that's not important. But anyway, like, so if, if you were a programmer, you wanted to create this game, uh, which was like an adventure game where you had a little character. See, this guy like, walks around. And like, you can give little commands. OK, look at the water. And the, computer's, you know, the program gives you a little response. Um, if you wanted to write this program, you had to uh, you had to create a sequence of instructions that could be loaded onto a floppy disk that could be understood by the machine that you uh, were going to run it on. The problem is that uh, there are many different kinds of machines, right? And every uh, machine has its own hardware. And it's difficult to produce a set of instructions. If, if those machines are not standardized, if the hardware is different, then you have to end up producing like different programs, different floppy disks for every different type of computer that you want to like sell this game for. You know, so, so this disk, if you look carefully at this disk up here, um, you, I'm sure you can't see it, but it, it says IBM Personal Computers. Like This program is designed specifically for the IBM PC Junior. If you were to install this in like an IBM PC, it wouldn't run, because the hardware is different. And the code for this game is designed for that specific hardware. Like For example, it has like music it plays in the background. That, the way that it, it generates that music is to interact with the hardware in this computer. Like it sends certain instructions to, to you know, play certain notes and stuff. Um, the format of those instructions 
uh, will, is only understood by this one computer, the IBM PC Junior. Right? So this is really a pain. Um, and you know, it's also, there's also the problem that like, you can only have one thing running at a time, like because you, you just have one disk installed in the computer. Uh, and you know you can't check your email in the background or something like that. <laughs> of course, there, there's no networking on this computer, so it's a moot point. All right, um, that's my example of before operating systems. Although I mean, at this time, this in 1983, operating systems had been developed and, and were in, in use for um, for at least 15 years. Uh, if we use you know, depending on your definition of an operating system, they just were not available for these really small, cheap computers. Okay, so. Operating systems were first developed for big uh, mainframe computers that were, you know, took up full rooms and were shared by um, many different users at corporations or in governments or at, at universities. But for these small, cheap computers, um, things were much simpler. And we still had that um, back in the 80s, uh, you know, lack of operating systems. So what an operating system does is it sits between the hardware and your apps. This blue box is the operating system, all right? And hardware at the bottom, apps at the top. Okay, this is a typical desktop use case. You may have, you know, iTunes, a web browser, a mail program, other programs, whatever. All right. So instead of having your iTunes program interact directly with the hardware to play music, because we don't want iTunes to have to understand exactly like what hardware you're, what sound hardware you have in the machine, for example. Um, instead, it, it interacts with the operating system through an application interface, which and this operating system has device drivers uh, that that installed that are configured for the specific hardware uh, on this machine. Right. But just looking at this at a high level, um, you can see some of the components of an operating system that we'll talk about later. Uh, like there's a file system, typically virtual memory, process manager. Uh, networking system. There's code to, ma to handle the boot up process. Like when you turn on the machine, it has to do certain things to set up the hardware and to set up the software. And then there are interrupt handlers, and uh, we'll talk more about later. Uh, yeah. One interesting thing about operating systems is that the term operating system means different things to different people. So when we ask what is part of the operating system, there are different ways to answer that question. And uh, one important distinction is the operating system kernel compared to all the other stuff in the OS distribution. Okay, so the kernel is is definitely like I think everyone would agree that the kernel is part of the operating system. Let me define what the kernel is here. I'll talk more about the kernel later, but the kernel is like this, this the central part of the operating system that runs in privileged mode. Okay, so the kernel is the only code on the computer whatsoever that runs without security restrictions. So I hope you remember from your uh, like computer architecture or assembly programming or whatever. And uh, that, like processors, well, I guess I'll talk more about this later, so you don't have to remember. But processors have two different modes of operating, at least. Uh, you know, modern processors do. There's a privileged mode and there's user mode. Uh, and in privileged mode, the processor can you know access any memory, it can access uh, the hardware. Uh, in user mode, it cannot do that. It's restricted to access within a s specific range of memory. Um, but, but the kernel code is the only code that runs in privileged mode and therefore can do anything. So it can set things up, it can change, it can access the hardware. Um, and for example, it can write output graphics, read and write to the network, write to disk, and handles the boot up and power down process. Handles memory allocation and process scheduling, um, which we'll talk more about later. All right, so this kernel code. And that's, that's really, when we talk about operating systems, that's really what we're talking about. But there's all this other stuff that comes with an operating system that you may think of when you think, when you think of an operating system. There's the user interface, um, which is sometimes called a window manager. Uh, there's the, there could be a command line shell. Uh, there's a software package manager, often, 
in, in good operating systems. Like, you know, there might be an app store. Or in Linux, there's like Yum or Apt, Aptitude. Or on the Mac OS, uh, there's this add-on called Brew. Basically, like simple ways to install new software. In some ways, those are part of the operating system. But, um, but all the stuff on the right side doesn't actually run in uh, privileged mode without security restrictions. So, um, yeah. So there's a distinction. And there are software libraries, and there are you know a bunch of useful applications that are bundled with the operating system, like you know text editor, compilers, web browsers, web server, maybe maybe an SSH program, antivirus, file sharing, media libraries, whatever. Like all that stuff that comes on your computer when you buy it um, that you might consider part of the operating system. Like those are just useful apps that were bundled with an OS distribution. Like Minesweeper is not part of the kernel of Windows. It's just a program that they include in every version of Windows, right? So just you, you shouldn't confuse the two things. Okay, it's an important distinction because when Minesweeper runs, it, you know it can't access the, the, the graphics or the network or the disk directly. If Minesweeper wants to read a file or um, communicate with another process, even though Minesweeper was written by Microsoft Corporation, it was written as a user program, so it has to like follow the same procedures that a program written by any other company or by yourself. Um, does when it's running on Windows. Okay. So, um, but in academia, when we talk about an OS, we mean the OS kernel. Okay. So, yeah, this is our very own ivory tower. If you guys noticed that. Um, so when I say OS, I usually mean the OS kernel. Okay. So, like I said before, operating systems have evolved over time as the hardware has become more complex. And generally what happens is um, the hardware gets more sophisticated, and users want to make want to do more sophisticated things because they have this, op this hardware available, uh, but then they need some kind, of, like, some kind of operating system support to manage everything and to make things go smoothly. OK. Um, and like I said, sophisticating, sophisticated operating systems first showed up on mainframe computers I mean, mainframes don't really exist anymore. I think that term is outdated. This whole idea of a mainframe and a mini computer, but because uh, like nowadays we have usually we just have what are called servers and client computers. We like these terms are kind of obsolete. But in the old days, like you know, if we're talking about the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, a mainframe computer would be like you know a big computer that was was you know, took up a whole room and was uh, very expensive and uh, used by, purchased by a corporation or a university or government to be used, you know, by the whole organization probably. And they spent a lot of money on those machines because, you know, those were the only machines that had large amounts of memory available, and you know, access to large st storage systems. You know, these days you can solve a lot of problem, big, big problems on your own desktop or laptop computer. In the old days, you did that in mainframes, but then gradually, like smaller computers were made available that were cheaper. And they're, like, they call those mini computers. And they were less expensive, but um, less powerful. But then you know, the mini computers of the 60s were roughly as powerful as the mainframes of the 50s. And similarly, the desktop computers that were being developed in the late 70s were roughly as powerful as the mini computers of the early 60s. It's so, like over time, like, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Like, hardware gets faster, gets smaller. Um, and the software you can run on, on those devices um, generally gradually moves from the big computers to small computers. So in the old days, if you wanted to do a scientific, like a, uh, if you wanted to calculate bank interest or something, you might have to do it on a mainframe computer in the 60s. But that's something now that could be very easily done on like your phone or your watch even, right? Um, so yeah, so this, this picture here actually only goes to 2000, but if you trace it down, it, Past handheld computers, and now we have just like wearable computers, like a smartwatch, has 512 megs of RAM, two CPU cores, and it has a real operating system. Uh, it's kind of unthinkable. Like 512 megs of RAM, I didn't have in my computer in, in, until uh, probably 2003. So, like when I was in college, I guess. Like your, a smartwatch is as powerful as the computer I had then. I don't know. Kind of weird, but um, so 
that my, that my point is that like every decade in this picture, operating systems for the bigger machines, a decade later, the same operating system concepts would be applied to smaller machines. Because a decade later, the smaller machines were as powerful as the bigger machines were a decade previously. Right? So generally, the sophistication of the operating system is always um, aligned with the sophistication of the hardware. And as the, hardware, as the small hardware has gotten more sophisticated, similarly, the operating systems have become more sophisticated. A good example of this is uh, that you might remember is like on the an iOS uh, with a, like the iPhone when it first came out in 2008 or 9 it didn't ha it had a very basic operating system like you would only run one program at a time on an, on an iPhone iPhone 1 first iPhone and up until the iPhone 3G you still could only run one program at a time and when you switched between apps it actually would quit the app that was running previously okay and that's because there was a limited amount of memory available on those uh, iPhones. I don't remember offhand, but it was, it was like maybe 256 megs of memory or 128 megs. Um, yeah, I think it was like 128 megs in the very first iPhone. It's actually less than the, the smartwatch. Uh, the, the Apple Watch today has the same hardware essentially as the iPhone 4. Um, it's it's kind of crazy. But anyway, so when the iPhone 3GS was released, that actually had a lot more memory than the previous iPhone. And that allowed uh, Apple to create an OS for it that would allow multiple programs to run at the same time. And that was a great benefit to the users because they could like be writing an email and decide, oh, I need to create a contact, uh, create a like calendar event, or take a phone call. They could make that switch and then go back to the email later, and the email would still be there um, with the text that they were writing, right, in the same state. So. Um, as the hardware has gotten more sophisticated, the operating systems also become more sophisticated. Um, yeah. But then that you know that whole concept of um, time sharing, of having multiple programs running at the same time, that was developed in mainframe computers back in the 1960s. Okay. So what what was developed in the 1960s for mainframes came to uh, smartphones around 2010. And that's just because the hardware uh, finally became uh, powerful enough. All right, so here's a little bit more detail of some of the history. This is a very condensed version of computing systems history. Uh, too much history is probably boring. Um, but then history without pictures is also boring. So I'm not sure how this is going to go. Uh, but in 1955, uh, roughly, this is like the very early days of computers. They had basically just figured out how to get them to work without um, crashing all the time. And uh, the problem they had was mainly loading programs efficiently and getting results efficiently. So if you had, you might have a dozen different programmers who wanted to use a mainframe computer uh, to get all their jobs done in like a single day was a challenge because loading programs was slow. And programmers wrote, by uh, punching punch cards and kind of like creating stacks of them. And you, you kind of like, if you had a job you wanted to run, you'd create a stack of punch cards, rubber band around it, and then you'd, you'd like give it to someone and they would run it through the computer later. So one of the innovations in, in that, at that time was to batch those, those programs together. So in other words, take like 10 different stacks of punch cards and stack them all on top of each other basically and run them through at the same time. So that's not, like there was more to it than that. Um, what you could do is take those punch cards and record the, the contents onto a magnetic tape, a single magnetic tape, and um, then you would run that tape through the computer, and it would kind of like execute the first program. When the first program was finished, it could immediately move to the next program and start executing that one, right? It wouldn't have to like load another deck of, car of punch cards, which was a slow process. So that was, that was one thing they did to like, make things a little more efficient. Okay, that's like, pretty basic and, and dumb. Um, but those are the problems they had at the time. Okay, in the 1960s, uh, computers were a lot bigger at that time in terms of the memory they had. So at that point, it became possible to have multiple jobs running at the same time, like I was talking about with the iPhone. Um, and so IBM OS 360 was the first OS, I think the first, that allowed multiple jobs to be loaded into the computer at a time. 
And the, one of the big advantages of this is that you can overlap I.O. So I.O. means uh, input and output. So if you're like writing, writing some output to <coughs> uh, a network device, although this time it's probably just writing uh, bits to like a magnetic tape or something, if they want like, to store some result, um, that is generally slower, much slower than just doing a calculation. So whenever your program gets to the stage where it's doing I.O., where it's, it wants to write something out or read something in from some like tape or some other outside device, that's very slow. So while that's happening, you can switch to another program and let that program do some work. This was an important, this was a, a novel concept at, at the time, multi-programming. Uh, of course, these days, that, that happens, that's a given in any operating system, that the, the operating system is always switching between different programs for um, multiple reasons. So one reason is to give you the illusion that, that everything is running at the same time, that even though you have one processor, like you have 20 programs running, that's a very useful uh, uh, illusion. But it also is, but switching between programs also lets everything run faster because sometimes a program has to wait, right? So I.O. is one example. Like if, it, if it's writing to a disk, it might take a long time for that write to finish. So in the meantime, it, it's efficient to let someone else do some work. Or it could be that like someone is sitting at the computer and they're typing. And they type one character, and then, then they have to like they haven't. It takes them a while to type the next character because they're like sitting and thinking, or they're just really slow. Like there's a like, human pace of of interaction, right? So. Instead of having like your text editor, for example, running the whole time that you're sitting there and typing, your text editor only needs to run after you hit a character. And it briefly runs and, and updates what's on the screen. And then it can stop running because you're thinking or you're like moving your next finger. Right? So even though that seems like it might be happening quickly, to the computer that's happening really slowly. Okay. And uh, multiprogramming and time sharing are very related concepts that um, allow the OS to, to get things done, multiple things done at the same time. And these were developed in the 1960s. Okay? So in addition to, so multi-programming and time-sharing are a little different because time-sharing is the idea of having multiple users uh, interactively connected to one machine, like logged into one machine, basically, and doing things, um, in, instead of just having like multiple processes that were like, um, kind of like background processes running at the same time. Okay. And so the interactive use of computers was actually not developed until the 1960s, kind of. Um, or, I mean, it was, it was developed, but it was made much more efficient by time sharing because, like I said, while one, while one user was sitting there and typing, another user could have their uh, work be occurring at the same time. So later on, things got more complicated. And OSs became more complicated. So in the 70s, parallel systems became commonplace. And um, you know, this was just the idea of taking many different processors and connecting them together in order to, uh, to do more work more quickly. Uh, of course, parallelization is still happening today on desktop computers, but it arose in mainframes in the 1970s. Um, and when this happens, you need to not just have multiple processes running like in memory and switch between them, which is what we were talking about before, but you need to have them you need to allow them to have to be executing at the exact same time. And that's a challenge because they could, you know, two processes could decide to access the same device. Like they could both try to make a sound or, or uh, update the graphics. Or they could be actually designed to work together, like if they were if you had split up a, a uh, pro if you split up some work among multiple different processes, in order for them to uh, coordinate, they might want to, like, for example, add up their results together into a single memory location. You can't have them both trying to, like, to add at the same time in the same place. So another important change in operating systems in the current day is that now computers have a lot of more, more sensitive personal information, like location and internet behavior. That is, that is managed by the that's available to the OS, and so that's and we're not going to talk about that in this class, but um, <coughs> operating systems have to evolve to be sensitive to that. And we also have different types of storage devices that are common, like flash storage. Okay. 
So um, that's, that's all I'm going to talk about in terms of history and uh, operating systems for this introduction. I'm going to talk more about all these things later. Um, but the things I want you to focus on now, after you leave this class today, are as following. OK, buy the book or look at the book to see whether you can read it online sufficiently. Uh, finish the doodle poll for scheduling. That's very important. Start the first project as soon as possible. I cannot emphasize this too much. Okay? Um, and then if you have trouble with the computing systems, uh, you can email root at eecs at northwestern.edu. Like everyone in the class should have had an eecs account created for them, which is like an account you can use to log into our systems, the, this, the few machines that we have in, in the tech lab. Uh, if you have trouble with that, email root or uh, talk to me. If you finish all that and you want more to do, <laughs> you can start reading the book. Um, and there's also a pretty cool uh, old video on time sharing online. I'll post these lecture notes online so that you can follow the link if you want to. Okay. Thank you.